I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the re-election of El Salvadorian President Nayib Bukele, who is very popular in El Salvador uh, and calls himself the world's coolest dictator. We have with us the world's coolest America's program director, CSIS's Ryan Burke. Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Andrew, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So tell us who Naib Bukele is and why all of a sudden he's really worldwide news leading such a small country. Yeah, Bukele is a, a generational leader. He's a, he's a young, flashy, social media savvy leader who comes from a Palestinian immigrant background. He went to a bilingual school growing up, so he tweets in Spanish, he tweets in English. He comes here to Washington uh, and feels very comfortable in the think tank crowd. When he was first elected in 2019 in El Salvador, he was elected to sort of eviscerate the traditional political parties, which had been discredited over the course of a, a number of elections by not delivering for people by continuing to have very high levels of corruption and insecurity, violence, uh, and lack of economic growth. And so Bukele's party, he started one of the traditional parties, he moved away from them, and he started a party called New Ideas. It wasn't super creative, but it definitely gave a, you know, an indication of what, what he represented. And then Bukele became extremely popular in El Salvador once he focused on the issue that defined his first term in office, which was security cleaning up El Salvador's notorious gang problem and incarcerating about uh, 2% of the adult population and about 7% of El Salvador's male population. Security was was his calling card in, in the first term, and it's a reason why he's gone global, really, but especially regional, as he's messaged his, his campaign of tough on crime very effectively throughout the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean. Ryan, I want to talk about Bukele's policy on gangs and how he's handled himself and what impact that's had on the country. But first, I want to just ask you, he ran for re-election, even though back-to-back terms are banned under El Salvador's constitution. Why did the country's top court let him do that? Well, there's a very important moment after 2019 when he becomes president. He tries to assert his authority over, over various institutions. He gets some pushback. And then in midterm elections, his party wins a majority. And with that majority, they're able to rearrange the Supreme Court such that you have pro Bukele, now a majority of pro Bukele judges on the Supreme Court who ruled in favor of Bukele's reelection efforts. So in past governments, there's been an express prohibition on reelection. Uh, that's why many of us have said that this second term is unconstitutional second term because it's always been interpreted as prohibited to to run for consecutive re-election. And nevertheless, here we are with Bukele with a very, very popular mandate for a second term. So, Ryan, let's talk about his control over the country. He's taken a number of unilateral actions and now seems to be in control of Congress as well. So he really kind of fits the definition of a dictator. But again, he says he's the world's coolest dictator. And he's really popular in his country because he's reduced gang violence and the crime rate. And even though he's put away some innocent uh, El Salvadorians, to be sure, people still seem to like what he's done. Can you first describe what he's done and then what has been the impact on actual democracy in El Salvador? First, just on the on the self-description of world's coolest dictator. So Bukele was making fun of an op-ed, I believe it was in The Guardian, which which called him someone who was attempting to message himself as a cool dictator. Again, Bukele is fluent in English. He tweets in English. Usually we believe when he tweets in English, he Washington is his audience, not El Salvador. And so it was a very pointed barb at, at the West or at Western media that was criticizing his project in El Salvador, that he could take it and twist it and put that as his Twitter handle, the title on his Twitter handle for a while. Keep in mind as well that his title on Twitter for a while was also Philosopher King. So he likes to play around and, uh, and use sarcasm like that. 
Uh, Bukele started by approaching the security problem in a pretty similar way as other past presidents in El Salvador. We had indication from investigative journalistic outlets like El Faro and others that he had tried packs with gangs. He had tried to negotiate secretly with El Salvador's notoriously violent criminal gangs to keep homicide rates low. And he had done so by paying them off, by promising not to police uh, some of their neighborhoods, and also, frankly, by trying to bring some of them into, into the political party. There was some politicization as well of, uh, of those gangs. But that's an informal setup. Those things are very, these truces and, and negotiations behind the scenes are very susceptible to break down if some of the uh, understandings break down. And in 2021, there was an outburst of violence where in a period of about a week in El Salvador, there were over 100 homicides, including massacres on public transportation, which clearly indicated that some of those conversations had broken down. And Bukele, on a dime, changes his policy to become one of a state of emergency, a state of exception, wherein habeas corpus was suspended um, and uh, extra policing rights were given to security forces to essentially arrest a number of individuals with any sort of outward sign or affiliation of gang activity. And what that has meant, and this has continued, by the way, Andrew, until now. This It's been ex continually extended by the Salvadoran Congress month after month, year after year, where since mid-2021, El Salvador has been living under a permanent state of exception. The state of exception, in other words, has become the state of normality. And as a Human Rights Watch report said last year, uh, I can be arrested for any reason. That was the title of the report. Nevertheless, I think you, you, can't, you can't underestimate the appreciation that Salvadorans have for this newfangled sense of security that they have. I was in El Salvador in, in the last year with a member of our staff at the Americas program. It's undeniable that San Salvador is a safer place. It's a more vibrant place. People feel comfortable being outside after 5 p.m., uh, which was never the case before. You always used to see people taking taxis and driving because you needed that security. You couldn't be out in the street. Public places are full of people. Parks are full of families. And so they are simply appreciative of the fact that they can have a better quality of life because they're not menaced by, by these gangs. But the trade-off is, of course, the mass incarceration policy. More than 77,000 Salvadorans are currently in prison. As I mentioned, 2% of the adult population, 7% of the male population, and that loss of habeas corpus. A lot of folks saying, if I look strangely at the police, if I have a certain uh, demeanor when I walk a certain gait, if I'm driving in a certain area at a certain time, these are all things that can get me scooped up into the dragnet. Okay, so let me ask you, what does the United States think about all of this? And some have said that the Biden administration has been supporting Biden administration and people in Congress have been very supportive of this administration because it reduces illegal immigration to the United States. So tell me how this impacts the United States and what does our government think about it? We've really done an about face on Bukele. We started with a hopeful relationship that then turned somewhat adversarial once we saw that the, the, the security policy couldn't be separated from the political plans of concentration of power that Bukele had. And now we've done another 180 in kind of coming to grips with the fact that Bukele is here to stay. It's a phenomenon. It has a traction across the region and we need to make amends with him. One of the reasons among many is that Bukele has China as a new ally. El Salvador flipped its recognition from Taiwan to China in 2018, just before Bukele was elected. And we were slightly afraid, I think, that Bukele would invite China in to become a major partner. China built a, a major library for Bukele just outside the presidential palace. China has been building out a major port. It built a mu uh, an amusement park in, in El Salvador. So we saw growing signs of Chinese activity. And I think we got a little bit nervous about the pivot, potential pivot to China. And the other thing I think we, we realized is that Bukele wants to work with us on, on migration topics. He wants to speak to the U.S. on issues that, that, that he knows we really care about. And so we've slowly decreased the amount of pressure. 
on Bukele over the last year and a half, such that it seems to me like we've made our we've made our amends with him. Mind you, at, at some points in the relationship, we were privately imploring him not to commit uh, human rights abuses in the security strategy. Bukele leaked those private messages from then Charge d'Affaires and former Ambassador Jean Maines to the public. That was a major rupture in the relationship. And we realized that this guy wasn't going to be wasn't going to be pushed around. And um, Andy had the China card to play. And so I think we've slowly walked back some of our criticisms and realized that, that Bukele is a thing. It's a phenomenon. He's here to stay. And he has appeal regionally, not just in El Salvador. Yeah. Tell me about that regional appeal. I mean, has his agenda influenced other nations who might want to follow in his footsteps? Interestingly, Andrew, Bukele hasn't traveled throughout the region that much. He's mostly stayed in El Salvador. He's come to the U.S. a few times, but he has a very slick marketing campaign. He's an excellent user of social media in all forms, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram. He's photogenic and young. And so his message has resonated in those forms, not necessarily through like a diplomatic campaign where he's taken a spin through the region. A lot of other countries in the region are having security challenges that on the surface look pretty similar to what's happening in El Salvador. Gang controlled neighborhoods, violence levels out of control, people feeling insecure. And so what has happened is a lot of politicians in the region, I think, have tried to get the fruits, the political fruits of campaigning on a so-called plan Bukele or Bukele plan for dealing with crime, but without actually understanding what plan Bukele actually entails or understanding what it entails and not being willing to do a suspension of habeas corpus permanently, the same way that El Salvador has. So you have a lot of folks in the region talking about a plan Bukele and talking about implementing one. Thus far, we've either seen those candidates lose in elections or win, but once they win, they don't, they don't actually implement a plan that looks similar to, to Bukele's in the region. So I would argue that there's a difference between some of the rhetoric that's going on and some of the willingness to have a permanent state of exception in the suspension of habeas corpus. Has this really benefited the United States in terms of a reduced illegal immigration situation? Look, the, the numbers are still high for parts of Central America, but El Salvador is certainly sending fewer migrants than, say, neighboring Guatemala or Honduras certainly fewer than Venezuela and other countries that are having major issues. And so from the U.S. perspective, it's all relative. And, uh, and Bukele seems like a better player on migration than some of the other regional presidents. So what do you think Bukele's long-term agenda is and where is he trying to take El Salvador? With this election, this, this, this second term that we mentioned, you know, he went around the Constitution to get, the question wasn't really whether he was going to win. What we were analyzing as a program was really whether El Salvador would vote for a one-party state. We had an event that was that had that title with a question mark at the end. You know, what does the polling say? Will El, will El Salvador really vote for a one-party state? And effectively, it did. There, there's very few opposition parties that have any kind of representation left in, in El Salvador's assembly. There was some changes to the constitution that were made before the election that reduced the number of seats in the National Assembly some changes with how they count out-of-country voting, which is a huge deal for El Salvador, given how big the diaspora is, especially here in the U.S. And that gave the advantage to New Ideas, uh, Bukele's party. But even so, the guy's overwhelmingly popular. He had over 80% of the vote. He claims it's the highest mandate that any democratically elected, elected leader has ever gotten. He may well be right. Even folks like Chavez, who were super popular, you know, would only get... 60% of the vote, 65% of the vote. So 80 to 85% of the vote is a huge margin of victory and has essentially brought El Salvador under all of the institutions in El Salvador under complete control of Bukele and, and his party. Uh, for now, Salvadorans seem to be okay with that. They, they think he's managing the country well. They're extremely thankful for this newfangled sense of, of security. But there are major questions in the offing, Andrew, about what the second term would look like. There are questions that he hasn't addressed in his first term, food insecurity, rising hunger, uh, a pretty poor economic outlook. The fact that Bitcoin was made legal tender in the first term and was not 
it didn't take off at all. You see these Bitcoin signs everywhere where you can pay at cafes and other places in Bitcoin. Everyone still uses the US dollar in El Salvador. Nobody uses Bitcoin. So there are a bunch of questions that need to be answered in, in the second term, and they could have real impact beyond security on people's lives. Beyond that, we worry a lot, Andrew, about concentration of political power. We think uh, rotation in office is healthy. We think checks and balances are healthy. And right now, when you see all of the institutions in the country essentially aligned with new ideas without many checks on, on Bukele's power, this is usually ended badly. Ryan, I think a lot of people don't really grasp how scary the situation in El Salvador was before Bukele came in and arrested so many people. Can you describe what the environment is like? I, I've heard it explained as, you know, people couldn't go visit their parents because they lived a few streets away and that was a different neighborhood controlled by a different gang. And so they wouldn't be able to see their parents for months and months and months at a time, things like that. Can you give us a sense of just how dangerous a place El Salvador was and has potential to, to, to be? Well, the homicide rates were astronomical. They were at the level of a very active conflict zone when there was no conflict in, in El Salvador. The government claims that now the, the homicide rate is 2.5 per 100,000, which would make El Salvador safer than New York City, certainly safer than LA and a lot of major uh, US cities. Um, in previous years, those numbers have been well up over 100 per 100,000 in some of the worst years. And if you are talking purely about mobility in the country, taxi drivers would tell you that they had to take elaborate routes to get places. They wouldn't go into certain neighborhoods because they couldn't pass. Street vendors, just like the, the most basic of economic activity, wasn't able to be conducted in some neighborhoods because gangs would control the major square. And unless you paid an exorbitant extortion fee, you couldn't have your food cart there. We ran into all sorts of people who told us stories about new types of economic activity that they can can now engage in because they're able to have their street stall open, you know, more, for more than a couple hours a day in the main square, which is no longer controlled or patrolled by the gangs. So it's really given a, a new sense of, of freedom to a lot of people. And as I mentioned, these public spaces are actually occupied now in ways that they, they never used to be. You see soldiers on the streets patrolling, that's a normal sight, but also you see a whole heck of a lot of people in major squares and parks, and that's something you never used to see in, in El Salvador, public spaces filled with people. So while all this is happening, Bukele has declared that, quote, this will be the first time where one party rules a country in a completely democratic system. D does that make any sense to you at all? Well, I would say that there were some democratic deficits in, in the election. I mean, we, we had quite a debate in the event we had uh, about three weeks ago now about whether this would be a free and fair election. And it basically got back to some of the changes that took place before the election even happened. The reduction in the number of assembly seats and where the diaspora vote is being funneled. So I don't deny that he's popular. I don't uh, fail to understand why he's popular. It's it's obvious he's delivered a real public good, but I I simply you know caution that this never ends well. When power corrupts, it usually corrupts absolutely, as Lord Acton reminds us. And uh, this is a classic case of a guy who clearly has an ego, um, and clearly has an agenda. And there's some pretty scary quotes out there. I mean, the New York Times had the vice president the day of the election in an interview. And the vice president said, yeah, we're doing away with democracy, but we're building something new. And by that, he meant democracy never worked for the people. What people had in the last 20 plus years after the civil wars in Central America, they didn't like that. It didn't it feel like it delivered to them. So we're building something new and edgy and it's going to, to deliver for people. But it's not going to be democracy. That's scary when I hear that, right? Because while it sounds all good that they want to build a government that delivers for people, the point should be to make to make sure that democracy delivers for people so that there's rotation in office and proper checks and balances and what this new thing is that they want to deliver is 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 pretty scary so do you expect the arrests will continue at the rates that they've been continuing and what about those people they've arrested 
that really weren't criminals but got swept up in this campaign inadvertently. There's a lot going on there. They are currently working on processing this massive backlog of what they claim are criminals, and they are trying them en masse. So they, they have massive prosecutions where multiple people are being prosecuted uh, at once on, on sort of express trials, which, uh, which is very dangerous, of course, and, uh, and is liable to sweep, sweep up a number of, of individuals. The other thing that the U.S. Embassy is very worried about is because the diaspora is so large in, in El Salvador, you have a number of American citizens, dual citizens, but American citizens who have been caught up in the dragnet. They're home visiting family. They, they live in El Salvador, but they go back and forth and they have U.S. citizenship that, who have been caught up. And so that's a U.S. citizenship services you know, issue for, for, for those individuals. But the other thing is this is now having an impact on, on the economy. As I mentioned twice already, you've got 7% of the male population locked away. Right. And, and there's a permanent state of exception, which means that at certain times, you know, you're not supposed to be out or if you're out, you're you're liable to be looked at a certain way by the police. So at some point, the state of exception starts to have an economic burden that that might be you know, more impactful than actually than actually lifting it. But I do think Bukele is going to have a tough time climbing down from this because he's he's ridden this security wave to another term. He has a brand as being tough on crime worldwide, or at least region-wide. And anything he does at this point to climb down from the position of master, mass arrests and a state of exception could be seen as weakness by the gangs, or could be seen as weakness by other regional groups that could want to come into El Salvador and set up shop. So I'm at a loss to figure out how he climbs back from, from this point where he's, where he's risen without seeming weak to some of the criminal organizations that he's made a name fighting. Well, Ryan, this is something we'll definitely have to watch, and we'll look forward to having you back to talk about the world's coolest dictator. I really appreciate your insight today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 